Okay, so hello everyone. Thanks to every speaker before me um, because a really interesting day so far. Um, so I'm Joe. I'm a second year PhD student in data intensive science at the University of Manchester, uh, where I'm working between the schools of computer science and astronomy to see how machine learning can help in future observations of cosmic magnetism. Uh, so what is cosmic magnetism? Uh, this is the study of the most distant and largest physical scale magnetic fields in the universe. And on these scales, there's a lot we don't know much about. Um, so I'm beginning with this quote, mostly because I really like the three words, polite cosmological society. Um, it's exactly the place I would want to live in, and I'm sure everyone in this room would also agree is a good thing to strive for. Um, but it also shows what an exciting field cosmic magnetism is, that we didn't know much about it uh, at the turn of the millennium. And while progress has been made, there's still a lot we don't know much about. So some big open questions include what is the large scale structure of magnetic fields in the universe? Um, how do magnetic fields form, evolve, and be sustained in galaxies? And how do magnetic fields influence uh, galactic evolution? Um, so I say that uh, it's an exciting time, and the reason I can say this is that there are many uh, exciting future observations planned. So uh, the origin and evolution of magnetic fields is a key science project of the Square Kilometre Array. Um, and we can now be described as what's well entering the era of precision magnetism science, um, where we're able to observe more uh, complex magnetic fields with better accuracy than ever before. Um, and this culminates with the square kilometre array. Um, so as well as having a uh, better quality of data than ever before, we also have more data than ever before as well. Um, because uh, the most important thing at the stage for the cosmic magnetism community is a uh, all-sky polarisation survey which lists the polarisation properties of every object. Um, and on a scale of data like that, you also see where machine learning may uh, come into this. Um, and it, uh, early science is now becoming possible thanks to uh, new radio telescopes, including uh, Meerkat in South Africa and ASCAP in Australia, um, with surveys including a, a Mighty with the former and Possum with the latter uh, immediately planned. So um, that's the world to know the observations are made. Uh, how do we actually observe magnetism? Um, so magnetic fields are, of course, invisible, um, but we can uh, observe their effect on radiation passing through them. Uh, through something known as the Faraday effect. So if you have a source of synchrotron emission uh, and between that and the observer, you have an ionised and magnetised medium, then through the Faraday effect, uh, the magnetic field causes a rotation in the plane of polarisation, which is detectable um, here on Earth. So if we observe the angle of polarisation, chi, in this equation, uh, against many different values of lambda, then we're wavelength, um, then we're able to uh, obtain what's known as a rotation measure value, which quantifies the extent of the Faraday effect and this is what we want to find because that's related to the magnetic field, uh, strength and direction along the line of sight. It's not as simple as going straight from observe polarisation, find magnetic field. There are a few methods to go from, uh, make, make these steps. Uh, the most simple is just to plot angular polarisation against wavelength squared. Um, here the gradient would be the, um, it would give the strength and direction of the rotation measure. Um, but we don't want to do this, it's subject to some ambiguity. Um, it can be used as was here in, with the MBSS catalogue. Um, but that's only because they were limited to only having two channels of data. Um, now we can do much better in ways that allow us to investigate more, more complex fields. Um, so one method could be QU fitting. Uh, this is effectively model fitting to the Stokes parameters, which are what characterise polarisation. But we don't want to do this either because we don't know much about complex magnetic fields at this point. So we want to have a method which allows us to investigate complexity and not have to assume a model. And for this rotation measure synthesis is particularly useful. Um, which allows us to investigate uh, what we call Faraday complexity without needing to assume a model. Uh, so RM synthesis works on uh, using a, a Fourier relationship between the um, polarisation observations to obtain what we call a Faraday dispersion function, which can be plotted against uh, Faraday depth, which is a, a generalisation of rotation measure. Um, and these spectra can be uh, visually inspected to uh, learn more about magnetic fields being observed. Uh, so the position on the x-axis, positive or negative, um, tells you about the rotation measure at of the magnetic field being described by each peak. Um, a peak can be described as fin, uh, which is, means it's associated with a region which is not itself emitting synchrotron radiation, um, in which case it, it, it's effectively a sharp point, but it's uh, uh, with a forward half maximum determined by the um, wavelength you observe at. So greater wavelength coverage equals better observations, better Faraday resolution. Um, but you also have cases where the region of the magnetic field is associated with emission itself. In this case, the, um, 
uh, radiation being emitted is then rotated by different amounts, causing a, a broadening of the peak. Um, and this is something we don't know much about right now, but that we uh, hope to soon, thanks to the new surveys uh, previously mentioned. Um, for terminology, simple describes one simple, uh, well, one thin case, I should say, um, and complex refers to a thick case or multiple components along the same line of sight. Uh, so machine learning comes into this um, because we have a classification problem with these Faraday spectra. Uh, it's hard to uh, very, very, uh, yeah, there's, there's a classification problem here that's non-trivial effectively. Um, so the peaks can have varying amplitudes, varying separations, and as with complex thick cases, uh, a fairly unknown nature at this point. Um, so, um, yeah, classification problem, not trivial. <laughs> And convolutional neural networks, uh, uh, we've heard a lot about them today. Uh, other machine learning techniques are available. Um, but they've been the most successful for this research so far, um, as well as for much else, including many image recognition tasks, which is why they're uh, largely well known. Uh, so they have been um, uh, identified as good for classifying Faraday spectra complexity before. Um, but work still remains in um, both uh, a deeper analysis of results on simulated data and also in uh, ensuring simulations can most closely match uh, reality in order to uh, end up with something that's far more, uh, that's properly usable in the future uh, for the surveys. Um, so, um, yeah, so um, one thing that I've been working on is, in my own simulations is to incorporate a fixed structure into the, the simulations, um, as the previous simulations only worked for ASCAP and with one fin and two fin, um, whereas fixed structure is also important. But also is that the majority of lines of sight, we don't actually expect to see any interesting peaks. We see no structure. Um, and these have to be classified out. Um, in machine learning terms, this is known as a class imbalance problem, where if you have different target classes with different numbers of samples, uh, a sufficient difference can uh, degrade performance. Uh, and many techniques uh, are used to uh, alleviate this, including cost-sensitive learning, where you penalize the classifier for misclassifications of rarer cases more pre-processing the data sets, which can be undersampling or oversampling, both uh, naively or uh, through synthetic and informed methods, um, and combination of ensembles of both. And also from one class classification, uh, which is completely ditching a binary or multi-class classification framework, and turning to uh, algorithms which work by um, recognition of a class rather than distinction between classes. Um, so why research this? Um, firstly, where is it's a class balance problem? Uh, firstly, it's most obvious, there is going to be a problem and it's important that we quantify uh, how much this will affect uh, real survey observations. Uh, secondly, it could have uh, important implications for source finding. Uh, so when source finding, you can uh, allow more false positives through uh, by adjusting your threshold um, and by seeing how much this uh, majority class degrades performance, we can then say uh, false positives are easy to uh, classify out at a later stage. So uh, you can allow as many through as, as uh, you can really want computationally constrained, or we could say they present a major issue, so uh, don't allow too many of them at all. Um, and also, by not assuming a uh, single imbalance distribution, um, we avoid optimising a network to one specific case, because as I say at this stage, we don't know what proportion of sources will be simple and, and complex, and in which ways they might be complex. Um, so we both don't want to optimise a network to a specific case, which isn't reliable in future. And just to ensure our findings are more easily utilised in future when uh, such distribution is more known. So a, another uh, means of investigating simulated data has been uh, checking past assumptions of a uniform rotation measure distribution, which would be the positions of the peaks on the x-axis of Faraday spectra. So previous assumptions have been of a uniform distribution um, but past survey results, um, although they haven't used the advanced methods as we've described before, indicate that the, hist the uh, rotation measures are far more likely to have quite lower values here. Um, so uh, I decided to investigate on a network I'd initially used for a uniform distribution, uh, see how it works with an MVSS catalogue. CNN1 is the initially used uh, uh, network, um, and CNN2 and CN2 is... Well, I'll come on to that, sorry. Um, so uniform's working fine. When I incorporated MVSS data, I noticed that performance um, got quite significantly worse for the classification of two fin cases. Um, so this is amount misclassified, more, less, and Faraday depth, so closer cases, which are 
more ambiguous, more easy to misclassify versus uh, uh, thanks. Sorry, um, versus further away colleagues, which are uh, easier. But um, yeah, uh, there's some stuff we don't quite understand here just yet. Um, so CNN2 was uh, something I developed to uh, because I'd initially optimized CNN1 uh, to the uniform distribution. Perhaps this problem is. Uh, is a relic of the classifier and not of, of the data or anything. So that was to, um, to check for that. Uh, CNN2 is much larger, in this case, more fully connected, more convolutional layers. Um, but the problem's alleviated, but it is still there. Um, and it can certainly be argued that um, if you use a uniform RM distribution, as people have before, then you're overestimating your performance a bit. You're incorporating less, uh, less of the difficult to classify cases uh, effectively. So it's important to be aware of this. Um, so results on simulated data, um, high level of accuracy, but we're dealing, as is very, very common in astronomy, with imbalanced data. Um, if you had uh, 99 healthy patients for one unhealthy patient and you uh, classified all as healthy, then you've not done any classification, but you're 99% accurate, so we need to have a closer look. Um, so this is a confusion matrix for such results, and uh, a classification report is provided by scikit-learn uh, with recall precision um, We've seen before, an F1 score is just a way of summing between the two effectively. Um, so this is really promising classification results. Um, there are known ambiguities in uh, classification of Faraday spectra. Um, a human wouldn't be able to achieve 100%. Um, so uh, I would have no qualms about describing the classifier on simulated data as uh, near human or human level. Um, However, the huge caveat in that is that I'm saying on simulated data. Uh, so for a start, uh, where we don't fully understand complex cases right now, uh, chances are that AI simulations provide uh, more of a, a, a neat framework of complex cases than what we're actually going to observe with real telescopes. Um, so we can expect that to be harder in reality, uh, although we can then adjust simulations accordingly. Um, but also, um, as has been touched on before, uh, good results on simulated data do not necessarily translate onto good results for real data. Um, so the, a big problem for this is that data is unlabeled. When we take a new survey observation uh, of a new source performing research, we don't know the grand truth behind it, uh, which is a huge harm to supervised learning frameworks which assume labeled data. Uh, so how can we use methods to move from our unlabeled data, from our labeled uh, supervised techniques to unlabeled data. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, so uh, one would be through semi-supervised learning. Um, these techniques assume a, <clears throat> a small uh, portion of labeled data and a large majority of unlabeled data, which is very realistic for surveys. Uh, you could observe 100,000 sources, and uh, it's feasible to visually inspect 1,000, but not visually inspect 100,000. So rather than just using a supervised baseline of a thousand sources, training on that and testing on the rest and applying to the rest, um, semi-supervised learning through many different methods uh, would aim to find some sort of structure and information in the unlabeled data set to help uh, better the overall classification. Uh, this paper is a good reading on this and uh, it's called a realistic evaluation of semi-supervised learning approaches. Uh, one interesting finding from it is that in many cases transfer learning is the best approach. Um, and it's particularly the best approach if you have um, very, if you're able to transfer from a similar data set uh, onto the ones you eventually want to classify. So this is uh, as seen in Holming's presentation. Um, and in this case, we believe we have this. We believe that we can simulate data quite accurately. Um, so transfer learning is most likely going to be the approach used. Um, and I thought I'd also note that um, these aren't mutually exclusive cases. Uh, you could, uh, in principle, label some of the uh, observations manually and uh, have your transfer learning techniques as well. Um, and there are some methods that uh, combine both. Uh, so use transfer learning and then use the labeled and unlabeled information to, to better this. Um, so perhaps that will be used in future. Um, generally, what I've read so far implies that uh, in cases where semi-supervised learning is best, uh, transfer learning doesn't improve too much, and vice versa. Um, but I think it's still very interesting to look into in the future. Um, so in summary, new telescopes provide big data, which enables and demands new methods, uh, hence why a lot of us are, are here. <laughs> uh, 
Um, cosmic magnetism are fields set to drastically benefit from new polarization surveys, which also need these new machine learning methods. Results on simulated data are very promising. Uh, CNNs are able to classify complexity with a high level of accuracy. Um, also, I, I note that the issues that uh, are faced in this research are ones that are faced through many regions of astronomy, so well worth paying attention to that of unabled and imbalanced data. Um, and, yeah, the future's interesting in this field, so hopefully we'll have some uh, interesting results in upcoming surveys very soon. Uh, so thanks very much for listening. Where your classifier classifies something as a simple polarization state, um, would you expect to be able to just take the data from the, um, those measurements uh, when you have them uh, and plug them into equations to calculate things without worrying about there's some complex structure here? Uh, if it classifies it as simple, yeah. y yes. Um, a simple case would be... I suppose eventually mean to get out the final parameters of magnetic field and rotation measure values from Indeed, this. Yeah. yeah, so um, for simple cases, that's a lot easier. Um, just locating the centre of the peak is uh, effectively what would need to be done there. Um, so for simple cases, that's very easy. For complex, it's a bit more, uh, a bit more unusual, but you could certainly describe the extent of the uh, region and, um, and where it's centred around, um, perhaps later when we know the shape that they actually take. We right. So for complex, would you actually need a human to look at it to go to the next stage? It's possible. Um, at this stage, we just don't really know much about fixed structure. So, um, it, it, uh, at the moment, you would struggle to very accurately define uh, a fixed structure. Um, in most realistic cases, we expect. Um, okay. So there'll be there'll be interesting future work on that. But for now, that's where we're at. Yeah. Right, thank you.